Um, I'm speaking uh, about uh, maybe partially non-psychedelic topic, but it originated in the psychedelic field. And it's also an interesting story about the discovery. And um, we will mainly hear here about, from me about uh, bromo-LSD, which is a compound originally synthesized by Hofmann in the mid-50s, by Albert Hofmann, the discoverer of LSD. And so it seems that his LSD placebo will at last become a medication. So that's quite interesting, but it's posthumous. He didn't know about that. So this is Albert Hofmann, as you may know. Oh, okay. I got that. So only to give a short overview, I will tell you very uh, shortly about cluster headaches and what it means. Uh, I will also tell you about the initial uh, kind of self-trials with LSD and psilocybin in cluster headaches. And then I will talk some about uh, bromo LSD and the treatments, what we have done with bromo-LSD already, and the future which may happen to bromo-LSD uh, if everything works out well. So what is cluster headache? Uh, so one out of a thousand or two or three out of a thousand people have cluster headache, which is a kind of very malign form of migraine. Uh, there is a male-female, uh, which is kind of opposite to migraines, right? And it's called suicide headache because uh, the people which have that disease are so much under pain that they sometimes have these attacks a few times a day and this for a lot of times in a row. Some people are even chronic that way, so they do suicide to avoid the pain. And it typically begins at the year 20, and there are episodic and chronic forms, so some people have only these cycles like uh, having three months of cluster headaches, then three months symptom-free, then another three months, or in a little different pattern, they have these illnesses, and these are, in fact, se very severe and repeated headaches, which are occurring in cycles, so-called clusters, right? So it's a serious disease, and we don't have the real medication for it up to now. And here is a picture which may give you an idea how terrible that is because you feel like a spear is in your head and going through it and you feel all that pain, right? It's really hard and you also have lacrimation and sometimes a full nose and so on, but it's a really hard pain. You, if you look up these kind of videos what are on YouTube about this disease and how the pain is going on, it's terrible. You wouldn't be, even believe it if you can't see that. So what are the conventional treatments? We have treatments which are trying to cope with acute addicts as well as giving prophylactic effects if taken on a daily basis. That's the usual medications, what we use up to now. But there may be a new kind of treatment with bromo-LSD and maybe with LSD psilocybin, which may be called preventative because you, you're doing the drug and then afterwards you have a kind of after effect which is remission free so you don't have any cluster headaches even without taking the medication on additional times. So oxygen, pure breathing pure oxygen may help a lot of these people in acute addicts uh, around 70 percent but you always have to carry a tank with you, right? So it's hard to do sometimes. Tryptanes, which are used for uh, treatment of migraines, are also effective in a lot of people, but they have some side effects, and especially if you take them a few times a day, you will get serious side effects, which are really unagreeable. And it's also a cost factor, so a lot of health insurance companies in the U.S. don't pay for that amount, what you really need, right? Verapamil is another medication, usually for cardiac uh, purposes, uh, it is uh, used as a prophylactic treatment, but that's off-label still, and it also has a lot of side effects which a lot of people can tolerate. So there's another medication, prednisone, which is a cortisol uh, preparation uh, that can have a lot of uh, serious side effects, immunomodulatory effects, psychosis, osteoporosis, and so on. So you can't take that really on a regular basis. 
and uh, some new ideas are because of the, the illness is so severe in the pain that some people even searched out for st neurostimulators where you put some, some uh, wires in the brain and stimulate so that you have less pain. But it was found out recently because it's a kind of rivaling approach to BOL in a way, but it was recently found out that they have a lot of complications, infections and everything, so everybody had complications, in fact, every patient, and so they are staying away from it right now. And also, it is the case, if you have the headaches on one side, for example, and you put a neurostimulator in there, it may change to the other side. So you got one surgery after another, and it really doesn't work out that well. Okay, so, so the history is kind of interesting, because a Scottish person um, with severe episodic cluster headaches was having it for 18 years, and then he wondered why he didn't get the attacks at one year, at a certain point. He always got it there at that point, and he didn't for months. So he was looking up his kind of diary in his memory and said, what did I do other than usual? And he found out that he took LSD in 1993, two times that year. And so he didn't get the cluster headaches next year. So he made that kind of causal idea up about it. This is what I already said. And so he was on his own taking LSD in a kind of regular fashion in a hallucinogenic dose to treat it. And he really prevented all headaches. So no cluster headache was showing up for this, for this time. And then he tried to stay away from LSD to test if there's really a connection. And the cluster headache showed up again. And so this guy was posting these uh, findings, these per very personal findings on the internet. And so some other people became aware of that and some of them are also psychedelic aficionados, I guess. So they, they don't mind taking such a medication. And so it was tried on a larger basis and they found out it was uh, very effective. So we have right now evidence that three substances uh, can treat uh, cluster headache in the way I will tell you about. One is psilocybin, it was tried out too, and it works as well. The other is LSD, not allowed in these preparations right now. And uh, the next thing is uh, bromo-LSD, which I will talk about. Here are some uh, batches from the 60s for analytical purposes. So what they have done then is my colleagues from Harvard, they had the idea uh, initiated by Bob Volt, the uh, head of uh, the organization uh, Cluster Busters, who was founded around these findings. And uh, he's also announcing that he is preparing material here where you can look, look up our studies as well as some brochures related to that kind of research. And uh, in the... Uh, year 2004, 2005, uh, Bob Walt was asking the Harvard guys, John Halpern, in fact, to do a kind of survey about these cases. So these uh, people were contacted by the internet, and some of them, 53, uh, were interviewed and gave their okay for getting the medical records so that they were really diagnosed that way, so we're really sure they have that disease. And nearly 60% haven't used any psychedelics recreationally, but they took it because of the cluster headache, and it worked for them. So these were the participants. And there was a use of psilocybin. Out of 19 cases, 17 had success treating their cluster headaches with that. This study was done by Andrew Sewell in cooperation with, with Harper and the department's chief. And we see episodic cluster headaches. 29 of the 53 took the LSD for prophylactic purposes or the psilocybin. This is not a very good thing here. And in more than 50%, it was effective even for breaking the cycle. But they didn't take it on a daily basis, right? 
I only took it one time, and then the cluster cycle was broken in more of half of them. There's no medication out there which can do that, right? Only to make that uh, clear. And 40%, it was partially effective. It diminished the pain. It diminished the frequency, right? So they may have, at that point of time, not really figured out what the right treatment regime would be and how often you have to take it and at what dosage and so on and so on. This evaluation, this uh, survey, gave some ideas about that. So the LSD users broke also the cycle and had some preventative effect also. And uh, 20 out of the psilocybin users have even taken psilocybin in between the cycles and had a preventative effect. It is still, by the way, a miracle what that mechanism of that is. You know, you may think about epigenetics or whatever, but there is no idea about it as far as I know. So here I will give you some number, numbers of the conventional uh, things, like oxygen. You see it's kind of effective and partially effective in the acute addicts, but it doesn't break the cycle, right? Please understand that. So tryptanes, the same is going on. It can reduce the concrete addict, sometimes even eliminate it, but with all these side effects and stuff. So you see, but psilocybin, with having not so much side effects, I would say, uh, is giving a much higher number, and it's only ineffective in a very few patients. So now we're going to the prophylactic kind of treatment, what they have tried in these self-medication trials, if you want. So lithium is not very effective in uh, having these prophylactic effects. Uh, Verapamil is also not very effective, but partially effective. Prednisone is much more effective, but it has these serious side effects, you, so you can't take it on a longer basis, and it's not allowed by the FDA. Uh, psilocybin is really effective in a way, I mean, more of a, than half of the patients, and with some where it's partially effective. And you can see LSD is quite effective, maybe even more so than psilocybin, but we are not quite sure because there are no controlled trials out there which compare these both medications. So how did we come up with that Bromo LSD idea? So at first, we were um, at McLean Hospital, Harvard University, Harvard Medical School, with Bob Vold, who is here, and uh, Professor John Harpern from uh, McLean Hospital. We were discussing LSD and, and how to do an LSD research project, how it may be connected to, to serotonin and the activation of serotonin receptors, but the prophylactic effects can, or the preventative effect can't be explained that way because the exude effects are over after a day so, and the material is out of the system. So we were talking about genes and however, and we may apply for a psilocybin study which was kind of planned and we were doing stuff on the research protocol and so on. We were also thinking about LSD derivatives and how did that come? So we were showing up with Bob Vault as our sponsor from the Cluster Busters um, at the Harvard Research Administration, and we were sitting in a room with two fireplaces and a big desk there and, and these big chairs and stuff, and they were sitting in front of us, and we were talking with them, kind of flexible at that moment, and then there was a kind of pause in the conversation, and that guy, the leading guy on the other side said, you know what? We, we had Leary here. You know, so it seems like there's a wall, you know, you have to go over, and that may be not easy. So what we did is we came up with the idea, maybe we should look out for the derivatives, but mainly for the purpose to prove that the most appropriate thing you can figure out in respect to the derivatives, the most appropriate derivative, may not work, because there was some evidence that only a hallucinogenic effect will give you the full treatment effect. And it seems it is depend maybe on that, right? So we had the idea to prove that the other medication, the non-hallucinogenic one, is not working. And therefore, we could go off on with the LSD study, right? So we came up with that. We already cooperated for some years. Um, and the idea was, first, 
what I told you, the hindrance of psychedelic research in, at Harvard may be a big deal. And there may be some dependence on the hallucinogenic effects. And we have looked for more than 100 derivatives. So I have looked for that before anyway for no reason. Um, and we figured out three derivatives which may be kind of appropriate from these few data which were generated during the 60s. And we came up with BOL-148, which is bromo-LSD. And uh, here you will be OK. So it is LSD, in fact, with one atom uh, done in another fashion. So there, there's a little difference. And it was synthesized. I'm not quite sure if it was 55 or 57. I don't know. I think it was 55. And they synthesized that as a kind of placebo to compare that with LSD effect. And they have done a lot of trials in animals and humans at that time. It means during the 60s there were a lot of stuff going on because they want to know. Uh, at that point of time they were of the opinion that the anti-serotonergic activity, which they have measured in a very crude standard with some tissues, uh, was... Uh, that that anti-serotonergic activity was giving LSD the, its effects. But they figured out that bromo-LSD was doing the same in respect to these crude anti-serotonergic testing, but it is not giving you any hallucinogenic effects. So that thing was excluded, in a way, by uh, bromo-LSD and these trials. So what they also found is there was virtually no physiological activity, even in the higher dose range like 10 to 20 milligrams intravenous, what they have also tried. And there was also no hallucinogenic activity, but some kind of curious uh, side effects, which will, will come uh, later in this talk. So here we see these both molecules, and you can see on the right side, I marked that with this orange thing. So you can see there's only one hydrogen uh, changed into a bromo. But what is not shown here, as far as I know, the bromo is much bigger. And that means it doesn't fit into the receptor anymore that much. There are some receptor interactions, but very slightly. OK, they have compared LSD and BOL in humans. You may know that. Up to really big doses. And they also looked out for, partially for military purposes, I guess, how they can pre-treat soldiers with BOL, making them resistant to LSD. Uh, but what they found is the psychic effects were not blocked, but some of the physiological effects were, were blocked. So it may be that it hooked up to re the receptor, but it's not pushing the button, right? <clears throat> so I will not go into that because of time reasons, so... But it is, uh, you can see some differences, mainly in the cerebrum, cerebrum uh, serotonin. You know, BOL is bringing it down. LSD is kind of neutral in that respect. And the CNS arousal is even going down with BOL, also in animals. And you don't have any hallucinations with BOL. So what we found is it has a much shorter time of action. And it seems that from some evidence that it's easily crossing the blood-brain barrier, as LSD does too, as far as I know. Uh, and it has no effect on blood pressure, pulse, ECG, EEG, and blood sugar, and metabolic rate, and so on, and also not on sleep. So it's a kind of side effect free material in a way. But there were some side effects found, but not in the dose range up to 50 micrograms per kilogram. There were virtually no side effects. Some of our patients, which have gotten uh, 30 mi micrograms per kilogram, they told us something. It's like a, like a half glass of wine. You feel tipsy, whatever that means. But, right? but in the higher dose range, you get these kind of tiredness because you get low arousal and restlessness, and sometimes, in some patients, difficulty to concentrate. I myself took a five milligrams, which is a kind of double dose, what, they, what we gave to the patients, and one marked effect was a kind of dysphoria. You know, it's not euphoria, like in most people from LSD. It's dysphoria, so that may be an inverse agonist, whatever, I don't know. But that was a marked effect, and it's also sometimes described, but it, it wasn't that worse, right? So. 
Okay, I hope I can go through these uh, slides. So we had some people synthesizing BOL. That was quite a big deal because it's not easy to synthesize that much. And so we also got an analytical uh, certificate for that stuff. And we used that in a few patients together with my friend and colleague, Professor Kast, who is a pain professor of Hanover Medical School. We have a specific law in Germany that in treatment-resistant patients, if you take complete responsibility and you're not relying on your insurance, you can do, uh, you can give every medication, you know, okay? But only in these desperate cases, treatment-resistant cases. So we have done a thorough examination of them. We have done a treatment protocol. We were going to the IRB asking for that, uh, if that is allowed and stuff, and we made these examinations and assessments afterwards. Okay, we, we were giving the hydrochloride salt, and important is we had three administrations five days apart, which was found out by that initial survey study that it may work on the preventative effect more than other uh, modes of application. And we were looking for the pain diary, obviously, and the clinical global impression and had some personal visit with the patients afterwards. And here you can see the treatment effects. Uh, uh, below is uh, these little arrows in the beginning uh, at the number three there. Uh, they show when we have... Uh, given the uh, bromo-LSD, right? Three times the people were under uh, clinical supervision at that point of time. And then you can see how it goes down. And here you can see the weeks. Uh, it goes 16 weeks and nothing happened anymore, right? So there is a solid uh, um, uh, preventative effect. And we even had some of the patients which were severely uh, ill patients which didn't have an attack for years, right? Kind of funny. How does that happen? So we also had one patient who had an attack when we applied the, the stuff, the substance. And there was a diminution of that pain during the attack in that patient. And there was obviously a decrease in frequency and, and improvement even in the first time when they had still attacks after the first application. Then they, their symptoms get better right, under the medication. And we had this remission extension, it was called. We now speak about preventative effects. And there were no serious side effects seen, even virtually nothing. Okay, what will be the next step? Here, I am, you know, you have to go into all these investors' meetings and with these financial guys which are kind of on paranoia, something may not be right with that project and all that. You have to find somebody who is willing to invest a lot of money because the pharmaceutical industry typically is not developing drugs. They're waiting for stuff and buy it for a high price. But then they can be sure it's already through phase one and phase two trials, so it's working and it's, not, it's, and it's safe, right? So you have to find the investors yourself for the first two phases. And that's quite a big deal. So I was involved with that. I'm a scholar, so I'm not really accustomed to these kind of things. So, but we realized a patent together with Harvard Medical School and Hanover Medical School. Uh, we reached some investors, but we also had some interferences about the patent, which I don't want to go into. Um, but uh, what we uh, intend to do is we want to proceed with phase one and phase two trials with these investors on board. And it seems that that may work out in, immediately in the next few days. And then it will be sold to a pharmaceutical company who will do the phase three, where you also have to invest more than kind of $20 million for. And then we hope that it will be established as a medication for cluster headaches. And there is some good um, foresight about that, maybe. So what are the... Uh, what are the advantages of psychedelics for cluster headache? It seems that they have less side effects. But there's a funny thing. If you think about it, you may think, oh, I took LSD and I got a side effect that I didn't get clusters anymore. You know, you can also think the opposite. Like, I take a medication for cluster headaches, but I have side effects like hallucinations and good, good mood and whatever, right? So, but in general, much less side effects than the other ones, and it's much less serious because... LSD, I can seriously say that, it's quite good physiologically tolerable, right? So there are no serious side effects, even from huge overdoses. Nothing reported like that on the physiological level. 
and they have to be taken only a few times. That can be a disadvantage with the pharmaceutical industry, right? They want a medication you take five times a day, right? Every day for years, right? If you find a preventative wonder drug, you know, you, you're, you're maybe not loved by them because they don't sell tryptanes. Yeah, and so university make a lot of uh, obstacles in their contracts so that they can buy it for the drawer. Right? That could happen too. Yeah? We want to sell tryptanes. We don't care about the side effects. We got the side effect out of it, money. Right? So, and you can have these long-term preventative effects. There may be even a possibility that we came across by chance, uh, uh, we came across a medication, a new design of a medication which gives such a huge preventative effect for such a huge period. That may be a new mechanism which has to be explored. And we also have shown that BOL, a non-hallucinogenic drug, is effective in cluster headache and it also minimizes side effects. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>